Um, all righty. Hi, everyone. It's Alexandra Maloney. I'm a BPI board member, and I'm the host of BPI Chats. I hope everybody is staying safe and lifted during this time. Our BPI chat series hopes to share the experiences and insights of members um, within the international affairs community and hopefully inspire the next generation to explore opportunities in this field. The thoughts and views of our guest speakers are their own and do not reflect the views of BPIA. We are currently streaming live <clears throat> and this talk will be posted on our IGTV and our YouTube channel afterwards. So if you haven't already, please follow Black Professionals and in International Affairs on Instagram at IABPIA, as well as our guest speaker who, whose handle can be found in the flyer on our page. And lastly, we encourage viewers to chime in below in the thread with comments and questions. And so introducing our speaker, Mr. Andre Uwakanye is a master, uh, is a student studying his, obtaining his master's of professional studies um, in international agriculture and rural development in the field of global development at Cornell University. His research and project interests include establishing education platforms to strengthen capacity of youth in support of emerging agricultural industries in developing countries. Prior to attending Cornell, DeAndre worked as associate director of projects for a management consulting firm based in Lusaka, Zambia, focused on technology for health, HIV treatment, and prevention programming, as well as public-private public partnerships and youth development. In this role, he managed USAID and the Bill Gates, Bill and Melinda Gates funded programs, leading teams in Zambia, Lesotho, and South Africa, as well as Malawi in the development of program management and country-specific strategies for international uh, non-governmental organizations, governmental organizations, and private sector organizations. Thank you so much, DeAndre, for joining us today. Man, thank you, Alexandra. Awesome. So I'd like to start off by asking, so how is COVID-19 um, affecting what it is that you're doing right now? Um, it, it, it's interesting. I mean, at least for the majority of my cohort, uh, we were supposed to be uh, traveling to uh, do our research, so traveling internationally. And uh, at least at Cornell, they put an international travel ban um, on um, on that. So we've had to kind of pivot and find other ways for us to um, obtain data in order to finish our, our research projects. So that's been interesting and just... Uh, really um, doing the online classes, you know, leveraging Zoom. Um, we've been trying to find ways to support each other, you know, doing uh, virtual happy hours, uh, you know, catching up with each other. Um, but we're also finding it as an opportunity to um, network with others. So uh, one thing that we have to realize is that everyone's home, you know, so there are people that you may want to reach out to, to ask to schedule calls. So that's what I've been doing mostly is just putting myself on a call schedule at least uh, once a week, you know, identifying someone that I'd like to sit and talk to to get some insights, reaching out to them, asking them for 15, uh, you know, 30 minutes just to uh, to talk. And at least there's been the opportunity there. But I think that for uh, most of the master's students here, just looking to pivot and see how to um, identify employment opportunities for those that are graduating uh, in May. Okay. Thank you. So the topic for today is around um, maximizing our networks and mentorship. So what advice do you have in terms of identifying mentors or someone who you may be interested in, men in being mentored by? Um, and what advice do you have in connecting to them, whether you know them, but especially if maybe it's a cold call or someone that you don't know personally? Mm. No, that's a good question. I think that uh, one of the most important things at the very beginning is to really understand uh, yourself and who you are, what values are important to you, and then looking to identify those same values in someone else. So mm. what I always tell someone that's looking for a mentor or someone older that maybe um, they don't really understand the concept of mentorship or they don't see maybe the value in mentorship is just always ask yourself the question, um, have you ever met someone that you wanted to be that person? Like, I want to be uh, this person. And it doesn't have to be exactly um, what you want to be, but you have to see pieces of yourself um, in a mentor and how they've been able to scale a part of your vision. Um, so 
um, at least for me, um, I joined the United States Peace Corps after uh, undergrad. And then when I was in the United States Peace Corps, I met two brothers. Uh, one brother, his name was uh, Gordon Brown. He was from Georgia. He was country director of a, um, a international NGO called Africare. And there was another brother named Greg Marchand who was from Houston. He had worked at Deloitte for eight years. And then he decided to move to Zambia and start a a company up on his own. And I met them through uh, a Peace Corps volunteer who was doing her third year named Natalie Gill, who's also African-American, who's currently a director of programs and training with Peace Corps Ethiopia. And when she introduced me to those two brothers in Zambia, and um, I met them, you know, they told me that they were going to mentor me after we were having a conversation. Mm -hmm. So I think that even for them, you know, being older brothers, they were looking at me to say they understood the value of mentorship, you know, and even though I didn't ask them, I think that they saw my potential and said that, you know, we should spend time and really uh, add value into him so that, you know, he can get to the next level. And I really, I really appreciate that. And I, that's why I wanted to talk about mentorship is that I want to really advocate for, uh, you know, black women, black men to be able to look down and identify mentees, because sometimes mm -hmm. as a younger person, uh, you know, you get kind of scared that you don't want to take that initiative to step up to someone, you know, introduce yourself and kind of asking them to take that position. Um, so I always tell people to reach down, identify mentees. But even if you're looking for a mentor, I think one, once you kind of know yourself, the values that are important to you. I think that it's just all about reaching out to people and just having a discussion and asking the question, how did you get to where you are today? And then let them talk through their path. And then you can kind of find, you know, areas for you to ask questions, you know, how to be, be better in this area. How did you do this? And just really find out the how and how in, in every step, how they got to that, to that point. And then whether it's once a month, once a quarter, you just continue to schedule those calls. And that just builds the relationship um, where you eventually get to a point where it's like, you know, this is your, your sensei, you know, right. you know this is your sensei. So um, I think that's, that's how uh, I've done it in the past. But luckily, I had two uh, brothers that um, were from the States, were traveling uh, internationally and thriving and that reached out to me and they were able to to lift me up. So I was I was definitely lucky in that respect, but I would tell um, anyone that's looking for a mentor to not be shy about uh, reaching out because uh, I think there are plenty of African-Americans, whether they're in international development or just working professionally, that are actually looking for um, you know young people that, uh, that want to have that level of engagement with them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm seeing a lot of activity in the comments. So keep them coming. Feel free to um, comment. You're seeing good point. True, true, true. Shout outs. Good advice. Um, hashtag sensei. <laughs> so again, everyone, this is our guest speaker for today, DeAndre Owakonye, who is a master's of uh, professional studies candidate in international agriculture and rural development with a background um, with the US Peace Corps and the development field, who is here sharing and discussing mentorship with us today. So if you have any questions or other comments, please drop them in the thread below. Um, but in the meantime, I have another question. So what are ways that mentees can also add value to their mentor so that it doesn't feel so, because I know for some folks it may feel a little transactional where it's like them pouring into you. I know for me, for example, there are some mentors or some um, folks who are in particular spaces that I wanted to learn from, but I also, as the mentee, um, and a student, I felt that I had some opportunity to maybe provide some research or gather some information. Anytime I saw some information that may be relevant to them in their field, um, I was sure to share that. So do you have any advice on how mentees can add value to their mentors? Um, yeah, no, definitely. That's, uh, that's very important. I think that's also a fear sometimes for some mentees. You think that you're pulling so much you know, from this one person and you're not adding value and you don't want to be, you know, looked at as, as, as selfish or as, as if you're using the person. Um, I think that uh, what's going to be really important 
is when engaging with your mentor is that outside of trying to pull out that you know information and those insights that you think you need for your professional development um what's really going to be important is to learn how to um really tap into building that relationship on a very, very personal level you know outside of uh, this person being your professional mentor you want for the person to feel like you know they're you know your brother or you can call them or you know they can call you at any time um so it's important to one getting to know them at the professional i mean at the personal level and to really understand like what do they like you know what is important to them and then once you understand those things their likes and what's important to them then you can figure out ways to add value there so if you need to do things for them or if you're providing them with information um, I think that what we were talking about uh, before, Alexandria, is that uh, sometimes you're working within organizations where you have senior management who may be, you know, a little, um, uh, maybe they're not uh, familiar with, you know, social media, you know, or these types of things. So, you know, come in and maybe show them the value of social media, you know, how to navigate social media, you know, just, just provide them with information from your perspective as a younger person, especially in your experience with technology. I think there's a lot of value uh, value add there. So I think that as long as you're looking for ways to add value and you do that little by little, then that's uh, that's awesome. Awesome. So shout out to, <clears throat> excuse me, shout out to a few of our BPIA uh, members and board members who are on the call as well as um, some of our speakers, past and present. I see uh, Byron L. Williams on, Vannery Kong, who's a BPIA board member. So the next question that I have is actually from uh, Vannery, and it says, what more can we do to help expose African-American students um, in international affairs at a younger age to create more visibility? Mm. No, that's a, that's a really good question. So um, I'll say, uh, you know, in my experience, um, I was working, again, as, as you mentioned, I work with a management consulting firm called Avention in Zambia, and, you know, the reason I got the opportunity to work with that firm is because one of my mentors, Greg Marchand, he actually started the company. I was working in New York. I reached out to him. I told him I was looking for opportunities to come back to Africa. And then he provided me uh, that opportunity. So in us working together, we have a passion for really bridging the diaspora. So how do you provide opportunities and platforms for African-Americans to come to Africa, to experience Africa and work? And what we did is we started an organization called the Global Leadership Program. It's uh, www.discoverglp.org. And with the Global Leadership Program, we provide fellowships for graduate students and for mid-career professionals where you can travel to Zambia and work on projects on short and long-term assignments. So that was really interesting in bringing African Americans to Zambia and really just orienting them into the culture and to their their work assignment and really talking to them about, you know, their experience. You know, we've had some fellows to stay for three months and we've had some to stay for, you know, over a year. Um, one of the things uh, myself and my director would do is that we would take advantage of uh, Africa conferences. So. You know, Columbia, they have an Africa conference, you know, you Chicago. Um, so in, in these Africa conferences, there are, there are these, you know, different panels. And, you know, you can talk about your experience internationally. And I think that that was one way for us to recruit fellows is that once talking on these panels, you know, after the panel, you have young people coming up to you and saying, wow, you know, that's a, you know, that's a real experience. You know, how do I get the same experience? And then uh, just keeping that relationship with them as opportunities arise abroad. So I think that's um, that's one way in which we've done it. But I think that, you know, even for us and everyone in the room that's worked internationally, you've had these experiences. I think just really taking advantage of opportunities to go to schools, you know, talk to young people just about your experience, even if it's very small. You know, you went to Ghana for three months, you know, you went on a missionary trip. Um, but it's important to go out and just have those conversations about about your experience, you know, and just being very transparent about, you know, how you felt about it, you know, fears and going, you know, maybe you had relatives telling you not to go, you know, we need to have those conversations with young people so that they can ask those questions and it can kind of set them up as they get of age to identify more of those opportunities and where they can uh, do that. Like I said, whether it's a missionary trip, a fellowship you know, employment opportunities. Um, so whether on, on a very small scale, if you're talking to your little cousin, 
if you're talking to an elementary <laughs> school, um, you know, I think all of those are very important because once, uh, especially being a black person, speaking to those experiences, the word, it just, you know, it, 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 it spreads like wildfire, you know, that, yeah. you know, the person has done these things and you should reach out to them. So that would be, uh, you know, that would be my advice. And another piece that I'll say to add on to that, thank you for that question and for your uh, response to Andre. Universities and schools, I the ones that I have contacted directly to go to speak to students, I've never been turned away. They are right. happy to have an older person, but still a right. younger professional person, to come in and speak to students, share their experiences. You know, it can be as simple as, you know, reaching out to a school, trying to get in contact with their principal or the dean of a department, dean of a college, um, and asking to go speak. When I reflect on my time in high school, I remember there being, he was an African-American gentleman. He was in the international affairs field. I went to public school in, in, in Southern Maryland. So, um, But I, it's been almost 10 years. I still remember him and his, a, a part of his speech that, that the influence that a high school French teacher had on him to go right. on his path into international affairs. Like, I still remember that now. Um, mm -hmm. And that, you know, I can't, I can't say or guarantee that that was the sole influence for me going into the field, right? But the fact that I remember that, that there was some exposure, and that was probably one of the first exposures that I've had to someone, you know, it was kind of during a career day or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. So thank you for that question. We also have another one here um, from KMTS7. And they're asking, as a mentor, what should I do when my mentee is asking for more than I'm willing or capable of giving? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so I think uh, in, in that situation, I think as in any relationship, some of us, we have a little, uh, a, a little reluctance to do. But especially in a mentor-mentee relationship, it's very important to set boundaries. So you should be clear and transparent in the very beginning so that it doesn't develop into something where you're really uh, uncomfortable, you know. And this is uh, something that, uh, you know, it's not a, a general rule, but it's something that I even tell you, young women, uh, you know, when you're identifying a mentor, you know, even for you, it may be important to identify a mentor that's also a woman because she's also going to see there are challenges as a woman that a man, you know, isn't familiar with, you know. Right. And I think that in a mentor-mentee relationship, you just don't want to, blur the relationship. So you need to be very clear about what it is. And as a mentor, you know, you're in the right to set those boundaries, you know? So I think that's something to do at the very beginning and it's going to save you um, a lot of um, headache. Yeah. One um, thing that comes to mind for me, so I can be very, I can be considerably bold in my um, <laughs> mentorship <laughs> request or seeking. So yeah. I remember when I was an, in, uh, an intern, right? An intern at the state department, um, I had emailed the, I was in the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs and I emailed, um, no, the, the assistant secretary at the time was doing like the, the coffee, at, you know, for office hours, you know, right. once a week or maybe, you know, I had a little 30 minute slot. I said, well, I would like to be a part of one mm -hmm. of these office hours. So I had signed up, went to go speak to her, had a great talk. And I said, and in my mind, I said, look, I got nothing to lose. So I'm going to try to make this connected and, and see if there's something there. And she very polite, was very polite. But mind you, she's an assistant secretary. So her right. life, I'm sure, is very busy. And right. she and I'm sure she has a whole roster of individuals that she's mentoring at all levels, you know, mid-level and senior level. Right. Um, but she was so polite in her response. She said, I can't formally take on any more mentors right now. I'm at my capacity. But what I can do is whenever I'm, you connect with my secretary, whenever I'm in the office, if you want to come in, we can maybe do like a five minute session or a 10 minute session right. where we can, <clears throat> where I can share, you know, some thoughts or, or give you some feedback or some advice. Like mm -hmm. that meant a lot to me as a little, as a little student mentee for her to be able to even be able to do that. Right. So yeah. for me, that meant a lot and contributed to my interest in the field too. So I feel like as mentors, we have an opportunity to, you know, really impact individuals lives with mentorship and, and how we go about it. So thank you for your, for your answer. With yeah. That. I'm really, uh, yeah, I'm really glad you mentioned that because, um, you know, that's a great way to ease in, right? 
You know what I mean? <laughs> As a mentor, you may want to even assess the person if you don't know them very well. And, and like you said, to tell them that, you know, Hey, I have like five, 10 minutes, you know, and then, you know, as you get to know them, you can kind of open up, you know, open up the relationship. So I think that's also a way to, to manage boundaries is to maybe tell them from the beginning, let's start small. And then as you get more comfortable with them, then that maybe blossoms into something uh, greater. Right. Agreed. Agreed. So there's another question here from Miss Raina Montgomery question. Uh, what, if anything, did your education at Howard slash and HBCU play in your global perspective and career aspirations? Did you know about study abroad? Um, you know, what's interesting is that, you know, when I was an undergrad, I didn't take advantage of the study abroad uh, programs. And to be honest, looking back, I'm not sure why I didn't. Um, when I was an undergrad, I minored in Spanish. So I was really um, enthralled by the diaspora and that there were Black Cubans and Black Dominicans and Black Puerto Ricans. I'm from Lexington, Kentucky. So <laughs> where I'm from, it was like Black, white, and then, you know, Mexican had started, Mexican had started to come into the community. But I, I wasn't really familiar that there were Black Brazilians and and I think that kind of opened up my perspective about just blackness in general and uh, just a, a around the around the world. Um, so I think that's really how it opened up my perspective. And uh, one of my RAs, he was uh, accepted into Peace Corps Cape Verde. And that was really my first, um, uh, really my first experience in learning about Peace Corps and thinking about it as an avenue to travel internationally and to be able to work internationally. So that was also a, um, that was also a point. And then um, in my Spanish minor, there was a class where we had someone come in from Equatorial Guinea and um, Equatorial Guinea is a Spanish speaking African country. So I didn't know that there were any African countries where people were speaking Spanish. So that also just, you know, blew my mind and you know, kind of changed my perspective about, uh, you know, blackness, you know, globally and language. Um, so that's where I was greatly influenced um, at Howard. Um, but unfortunately, I didn't take advantage of the, the study abroad programs. And, you know, looking back, I really wish that I would have. Mm. Thank you, everybody, for your questions and comments. Please feel free to keep them coming. We're here with our speaker, DeAndre Owakanye, who's a master's of professional studies a candidate in international agriculture and rural development in the field of global development at Cornell University. He has a background in uh, international development and the Peace Corps, as well as other uh, consulting experience. So please continue to uh, drop your questions in the thread below. <clears throat> so my next question for you um, is, is there anything that you know now that you wish you would have known when you first started this journey? Um, you know, I think that one thing that I, I, I wish that I knew is that when I, when I left uh, Peace Corps, I moved to New York, and I mean, I was applying for so many jobs. I mean, I'm talking about probably hundreds of applications um, because I really wanted the balance of uh, having uh, maybe a career in the States and to have a lot of international travel. That's what I was looking for. So if I could have spent, you know, 60% of my time in New York and 40% of my time traveling across Africa, you know, of course, that, that would have been perfect for me. That's that's the dream. Mm -hmm. So I was applications spewing them out and I just wasn't getting the responses that I thought that I should be getting and it was just very frustrating and I think that what I know now that I wish I would have known then is that um, it's really all in your network you know you really need to leverage your network when you're trying to uh, to, to get a job so uh, now uh, back then I wish that I would have been reaching out to my network scheduling calls um, talking to people, telling them exactly like what I wanted to do, you know, where have I looked? Because what happens when you call one person, they're like, you know what? I know somebody in, uh, you know, this office that you should talk to, then you have another yeah. call. Like, you know what? I so know somebody, then you have another call. And then eventually, you know, that leads to 
someone saying, hey, you know, there's this position, you know, come in, let's talk about it. Uh, you know, to the point where sometimes you don't even, maybe you don't even fill out an application or maybe they're just like, look, you can start, you know, on Monday. So, and I've just seen that through international development where international professionals, some people have even told me they've never filled out an application, mm. you know, and it's really just through their network and, you know, people just calling on them. They know they have certain technical expertise. They know what they're interested in. Um, they have a conversation about the position and they just kind of position them uh, from there. So, and I, I also would, think that it's appropriate when you're sending that email that information to one person who you may um, have as a connection to share your resume and say, feel free to circulate this <laughs> to right. your networks right. and your community. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. I like that. I like that. Mm -hmm. that that's that's mm -hmm. a good one. Feel free mm -hmm. to circulate. This. And don't be afraid to say that you're actively looking for, you know, graduate or recent graduate actively looking uh, for a position or to speak to people in the field, speak to people right. that are in that industry to mm -hmm. So that just caused a lot of stress, you know, as a as a younger person, you know, imagine the the amount of time you're spending, you know, tailoring your resume and your cover letter and, and more blindly, you know, putting out um, applications instead of, you know, looking at your network and looking at who you know in different organizations and mm -hmm. reaching out to them before you actually put all that effort in on the uh, on the front end. So that's really something I wish I knew uh, when I was younger. I wasn't taking that approach. Mm -hmm. Someone put hashtag feel free to circulate. Yeah, so feel free to keep uh, dropping questions or comments that you may have in the thread. Uh, I'm just quickly scrolling up to see if I've called the questions here. Uh, someone has a question about balancing personal and professional um your personal and professional life in a mental relationship so could you speak on you know what topics may be appropriate with what type of mentor sometimes folks have a professional mentor that's for career and sometimes folks have a personal mentor that's like for life so maybe right. you could distinguish those two things mm -hmm. for, for that person no no definitely um you know for me i think that uh you just really need to be uh I guess, uh, you know, socially aware and to kind of fill out, you know, social cues. And when you're talking to the person that you've identified as a mentor or that's mentoring you, um, you need to really kind of gauge what this person is comfortable uh, talking about. And a lot of times maybe I'll, I'll prompt them. And if they continue on, you know, on that subject, then great. If they don't, then I don't, I don't push it. You know, so that's what I usually do. And then if there's things from a mentor that you think you're not getting, then, you know, you look for, you know, a different mentor. Um, so I really try not to uh, push so much as I understand that, again, like you said, you may have a mentor that's, you know, very busy. They're also mentoring a lot of other people. So uh, you definitely want to show your appreciation for the time that they're committing and the value that they're adding to you. So I don't push so much, but I do prompt. And uh, if there are situations where I'm having like issues or challenges, sometimes I may ask them, you know, have you ever faced X issue? Not that it's necessarily my issue, but I may have a situation to say, you know, how have you dealt with this, you know, in your position? Um, so sometimes I'll give scenarios that are maybe outside of myself and then ask them, have you ever dealt with something like this? You know, how have you and, and what would you do in this uh, situation? Um, but, yeah, I think that you're also right is that sometimes you might separate the two and have someone where it's professional and personal. But if you have someone that's both, you know, I think just being very careful uh, and make sure that you're you have an understanding of uh, their comfort level and what they want to to talk about. And then you can kind of creep into, you know, what you want to uh, to address from there. Thank you for that. Do uh, you have any tips specifically for informational interviews? So, like, what sort of questions um, would you ask during an informational interview? Um, and what questions would you not ask <laughs> during an interview? You know, um, during an uh, informational interview... Um, and maybe I also by sharing what an informational interview is for people who may not know. 
Okay, definitely. Um, you know, when we talk about informational interviews, it's just really, you know, scheduling a, a call or a coffee with someone um, that maybe you're interested in um, what they're doing professionally, and then just asking questions, you know, about their job, you know, what are their day-to-day uh, -day tasks, you know, what challenges do they face, you know, how did you even uh, break into this, to this industry, you know, did you have mentors, you know, who did you reach out to? Um, so I think just in the in the very beginning, um, I'm just I'm really all about the story. You know, I love the stories, you know, uh, especially in international development. You find people that have all these just interesting experiences. And sometimes you can't even believe how they got into the industry. It's just uh, uh, I think that some people think that uh, especially when you're younger, you think that life is just like this straight line. But it's actually you go this way. You know, you work at this place and then you meet this person. So. Um, I really start off with, you know, just tell me about, you know, your path, you know, how did you get into this position, you know, starting from the very beginning and kind of get their life story and then just asking uh, and questions from there. And, um, you know, I, I'm all about uh, learning more about the boundaries and how people have overcome obstacles. So I also, uh, you know, focus on that and maybe, you know, some of the obstacles they face, you know, how do they overcome it? How do they even, you know, cope with some of the disappointment if there was disappointment, you know, because I think those are really some of the big things that, um, you know, we suffer with uh, when we're trying to come up professionally is that, you know, when you come up with the, when you hit those walls, you know, you start to get discouraged, you're trying to figure out, you know, how do you overcome this? So I think those are important questions to, to ask uh, as well. And the folks that ask me questions sometimes, because I get some questions about mentorship and things like that and interviewing informational. Um, one, I, I have a few pieces of advice that I like to give, but one is I like to talk to this person as if it's the last time that I may speak to them. Right. So by right. leaving on E, like leaving empty, that I know that I answer, that I asked the questions that I was curious that only this person would know. Right. Mm -hmm. So not, you know, I always advise people do your research before you go and speak to people so that you have some background on the agency, on the organization, on the industry of the field. That can be as easy and quick as a Google search before going to speak to these people, right? So that you're able to go into these conversations saying, hey, I read an article in the New York Times about this specific thing that's in your agency. I want to get some perspective on that. Or what do you see are the trends? Where is this industry going? What are things that I should be looking into? Mm -hmm. You know, what are, I love to ask people, what are things you knew now, that you that you know now that you wish you knew? Because, mm -hmm. you know, the key of it is about learning. You want yeah. to learn from other people's experiences, right. ex mistakes, et cetera, um, mm -hmm. and apply that to yourself. So those are a few uh, tips that I have. And I think to, that's a really important point yeah. is that for everyone to understand, you know, this is from a position of learning. So I don't think that there should be really any reluctance in, you know, reaching out. And I think that's the, the biggest step is that uh, for me, you know, via LinkedIn, I have no qualms and, you know, sending messages, introducing myself, you know, wondering okay. if you would have time for a call, you know, really yeah. interested in what you're doing. You know, even if I don't know them well, you know, I can just ask them for some time. And then what I found found is that a lot of people are very open to talking, you know, yeah. so uh I think that that's really the biggest hurdle is that, you know, really just taking that initiative to reach out to people. Because what you'll find is that more people are really interested in talking to you, uh, to you as well, and they will make that time. Right. And I know some folks may be kind of nervous or hesitant or they may be new to networking and new to connecting in that way. Um, so one piece of advice that I give is that usually, you know, folks like to hear, like to <laughs> hear themselves speak sometimes. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So I always uh, give the, give a, give a tip to ask, you know, if you are nervous with someone high level or you don't know what to talk about, you know, put the conversation on them, ask them to share about themselves. Tell me more about what you do. What are you passionate about? Oh, mm -hmm. you know, ask them more about their opinions with the organization and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um so my next question, um, and for those who are in the thread, hi, I see a lot of people have joined in um, over the past few minutes, and we are here with our speaker, uh, Mr. DeAndre Owakonye, candidate in international agriculture and rural development in the field of global development at Cornell University. It's a long time to, <laughs> to say a long thread. Um, 
at Cornell University, and he has a background in uh, the U.S. Peace Corps and development, and he is here sharing with us so many gems um, and pieces of advice in terms of mentoring and mentorship, especially in the international um, affairs career uh, field. So my next question for you is a little bit more about your experience and your experiences abroad. Um, I actually, I saw that, uh, that Byron L. Williams is on, who was our previous speaker at 11. Uh, so I wanted to give him a shout out. And I also saw um, uh, Jazz from the Monday uh, call. So I wanted to say hello to everyone who has been past, present, and future speakers uh, for BPI chats. But my next question for you uh, relates to obstacles that you may have had to overcome in your international experience. So if you've had any specific experience, general advice for how to face some of these challenges as a person of color um, going overseas. Um, you know, what's uh, interesting is um, when I joined the United States Peace Corps, I traveled with about 40 other people to Zambia. And, uh, you know, I served in southern Zambia. I served two years as a, as a health extension officer. I worked with a community-based organization organizing HIV AIDS trainings, um, organizing support groups, and I taught eighth grade uh, English and civics. And I had a really uh, incredible experience. Um, but when I was traveling with 40 other people, I was the only African-American male uh, in that group. And there was mm -hmm. one other African-American female. And then when we traveled to Zambia, I was... It was myself and it was one other African American male and he was leaving. So I so we were basically just switching places and I was the only African American male in the country and there were about hundred and twenty volunteers in Zambia, um in Zambia at the time. Uh so that was challenging, but when I came into southern Zambia, there was a young lady named Jennifer Dyson who was a Howard grad and she was already there. So that was wonderful. And then uh, one of my good friends was Shea Howie. She was in Eastern Province. And as soon as I got in the country, I received a Bush note. And then for Peace Corps, you know, a Bush note is just someone's written you a note. They give it to one person. The other person gives another person. And it just goes around until it gets into the hands of the recipient. And I was on a bus and someone handed me a note. It was from Lashea. Welcome. I heard yeah. a brother's in the country. And, you know, it was just really uh, uh, comforting to, you know, receive that welcome as I'm, um, you know, in a, a sea full of uh, white folks, um, <laughs> you know, and I'm the only uh, black male and then, but living in an all black country in, in, in Zambia. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, what I found in, you know, working, you know, in the village, you know, I was in a very rural area, you know, I had the, the mud hut, grass roof, you know, no water, no, no, no electricity, no running water, no electricity. And, um, you know, what I found is that locally, a lot of Zambians, they didn't really, outside of not having met an American, they didn't even really uh, understand the concept of being Black and American. So right. a lot of Zambians were asking me questions about, you know, they were saying, you know, is your mother white? You know, is your father mm -hmm. white? You know, because they didn't really understand how I was uh, a Black American. So I think in the very beginning, that was my... Um, that was a challenge for me because growing up, my mother's from Kentucky, but my father's Nigerian. So, and, and, but my father didn't raise me. So I didn't really have that side, but I always identified, uh, with Africa. So it was interesting in landing and understanding that I'm amidst all these black people, but I'm really starting to, uh, identify even more, you know, as an American, because there's, there's this gap you know, as far as our, our, our experiences. So mm -hmm. that was really interesting. And that just really put me in a position to always be listening and learning and to be able to teach people about, you know, my culture, you know, where I'm coming from and to not be uh, judgmental. Um, so that was one of the, uh, the barriers in really um, when we talk about identity you know, you know, and who you are, and you, you're having this international experience, and you're engaging with, you know, local Africans, and it's like, it's like, where's, uh, where's your position? So mm -hmm. that was, um, that was kind of a, you know, that was definitely a barrier in the very beginning. And at least in my, um, my work experience in international development, you know, at least in management consulting, I've had the opportunity to work in 
uh, five African countries in Southern and Central Africa. And every, um, every country that I go to, that's the approach that I take is that I'm learning here. You know, even if I'm there to work, you know, I'm all about, let me ask questions. Let me be open uh, culturally. Let me not judge so that I can learn, um, you know, as much as possible and to be able to assess and to kind of sift through, you know, all, all of this information to, so to better position myself to have more impact on the people that I'm, you know, that I'm working with. Um, so I think that's one of the things that I've learned. But, you know, culturally, um, sometimes there are, there are leaps um, that you need to identify and just to not get frazzled and to, uh, you know, figure out how to ask the right questions and talk to the right people to understand where you, where you fit best. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that response. So we have, um, we'll take one more question from the comments and then I'll have one concluding question. And it's coming from, I'm a be well. I like that, uh, <laughs> that pun there. Um, Andre, as someone who has been mentored as well, do you see yourself as a mentor now? And what's your philosophy that you follow when you are doing the mentoring? Um, no, that's a, that's a really great, great question. Um, yes, you know, I definitely see myself as a mentor. Um, and I'm always, uh, happy when, uh, you know, younger brothers, uh, you know, they approach me, introduce themselves. And then I find myself in that mentor, uh, mentee relationship. Um, I think that my approach as a mentor is just to really be, um, as transparent as possible um, about my experiences. Um, when I was younger, you know, there were certain fears that, you know, I had in, you know, talking to a mentor, like you were saying, you know, what do you talk about? You know, are you crossing the line? So I just try to be fully transparent to let them know that any concerns that you're having, if you need anything, you know, please reach out to me, you know, please call me because I don't really find a lot of mentees that, you know, are really, you know, take it, take really fully take advantage of that relationship. So I try to just let them know that I'm an open book. You know, you can reach out to me if you're having uh, issues with something, if you're having challenges, you know, please reach out and just to see, you know, how much they actually, you know, use me. Um, so I think that's the position I take um, in mentorship and just also just letting them know that, you know, I have a network and that I don't mind um, introducing them to people or, you know, giving them the opportunity to talk to someone that they're interested in talking to. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's my approach is to be transparent about my experiences, to be transparent about, you know, my fears, where I've had trouble, and then what I've done to um, overcome those obstacles. Thank you for that. There was one other question that I wanted to um, jump in that I saw here, yep, that I wanted what made you specifically choose agriculture as your field of study? Okay, so um, so when I was working in Zambia, uh, our firm, we were invited to a partners meeting in Nairobi with the Rockefeller Foundation. They had an initiative called uh, YieldWise, and it's to reduce uh, food waste globally. So we were there as a resource partner, so we were really there trying to uh, get some work from some of the implementing partners who had budget. So we were trying to get some some work from them. So it was about a three day um, a three day meeting. Um, there were you know organizations across Africa, Nigeria, Uganda, South Africa, um, and I don't have an ag background. But in this, uh, in this partners meeting, this is where I really understood the intersection between agriculture and youth. For my background being more uh, HIV prevention and uh, youth economic development. So here I saw an opportunity of I learned of uh, companies in uh, Rwanda, there's a company called AgriLift, you know, they leverage uh, drone technology in agriculture. So I was learning about drones that, you know, they can uh, assess, you know, different soil types. And I was like, oh, man, this is like, you know, just really opening my mind. And so when I saw this uh, program at Cornell International Agriculture, I went in thinking, 
you know, what are ways that we can re-engage uh, youth in agriculture leveraging technology? But then as I came in, um, beforehand, I spent a year in Lesotho, working in Lesotho on a women empowerment program. So I lived in Lesotho for about a year. And when I was in Lesotho, um, they were in the process of legalizing cannabis. So they were legalizing cannabis for cultivation and for export. So I came into uh, Cornell when I was thinking about my research project. My research project is more about uh, strengthening capacity of youth in support of emerging agricultural industries um, in developing countries. Um, so I'm doing a case study in Lesotho on the growth of the cannabis industry and then advocating for education platforms uh, so that youth can better support you know, the growth of this emerging uh, ag industry. So where I am at Cornell in the fall, uh, they offered a cannabis course that I took. And next year they're offering a master's in cannabis, it's uh, hemp science. So I'm looking at that and to say that, you know, they need to be doing these same things at the National University of Lesotho, at the University of Zambia, at Makadeti University in Uganda. You know, they, they're going to need these platforms in order to get people and how do we roll out a curriculum uh, across Africa because when I came into the program in 2019, um, it was legalized in Lesotho, it was legal in South Africa for private use, um, but now it's legal across uh, six countries in Africa. It's legal in Zambia, Malawi, um, yeah. Uganda, um, so that's, uh, that's why I went to international agriculture. So even though I don't have that ag background, strong ag background, I'm looking at this more as, uh, how are we strengthening capacity of youth to support, uh, so to support emerging ag industries in Africa? Awesome. That is so, I'm, I feel like I'm learning new things <laughs> here in this call. So thank you so much. That is so interesting, um, to hear about. So my final question, um, and feel free to also add any concluding thoughts to this particular question. Um, but it's simple. I'm asking every speaker for the students and the young professionals who may be in, listening to this call, um, what advice do you give, would you give for someone who is considering um, this particular, like the same type of, as a Peace Corps volunteer or the, the job that you've had or the agricultural field? What advice do you have for them? Mm. So I think, uh, you know, one thing um, which I think I, I wish I would have done uh, more of, especially coming out of undergrad, is to understand that there are a lot of platforms for you to travel internationally, whether, again, uh, someone mentioned, uh, you know, study abroad, um, you know, if you want to teach in Mexico, if you want to learn, go and teach English. Um, I think that um, in the, uh, the, 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 the last call, um, we talked about the different fellowships, you know, Wrangell Fellowship, you know, um, there are all of these, you know, fellowships and academic opportunities for you to um, travel abroad and to have an international experience. So I think that really just getting on that early and, you know, uh, you know, especially at the university level, if you can communicate that even at the at the high school level for, for younger kids to say, you know, there are these opportunities. Mm -hmm. So be thinking about that freshman, you know, sophomore year of college. And there were people that, you know, did have this information and they were on it very early. And fortunately, you know, I didn't necessarily have the information, uh, you know, early as well. So there are fellowships, there are opportunities to teach English in Southeast Asia, you know, in South Africa. Um, I know that, uh, especially at the university level, at the business schools, you know, they usually have opportunities for you to travel uh, to South Africa to learn about private sector organizations that are working there. You know, there's Disney, there's Sony. Um, so I think those are uh, things to just really very early, you know, a bunch center at Howard University, you know, definitely, <laughs> you know, to reach out to them. Um, so to really just... Uh, Look at those, look for those opportunities. And I think that not being shy about just speaking it to existence and to say that this is what I want to do. And there's going to be somebody that's going to hear you and say, oh, you know, oh, I actually do that. Or I know someone that does that and they're going to, you know, they're going to put you on, 
you know, I think that sometimes we have these ideas, but we don't really put them out there. And we're not really talking to people about, you know, what you actually want to do. Um, because you could be talking to someone that has access to that, and you know, they don't know, you know, they don't know that you're interested in that. So I think that that's a, uh, that's very, very, that's very important. Yes. Well, thank you so much, DeAndre, for coming to speak to us and share your experiences. Um, for folks who are on the call, thank you all for joining. Please follow uh, IABPIA as well as DeAndre. His handle can be found on the flyer on our page. Um, and we look forward to sharing more uh, wisdom and knowledge as we continue this BPIA Chats uh, series. So I hope everyone has a good day and stay safe. Hey, out there. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks. Have a good day, everyone. All right. Bye. Bye.